Okay, we're now going to try and stretch our minds a little bit and stretch SuperCloud to the edge. SuperCloud, as we've been discussing today and reporting through various breaking analyses, is a term we use to describe a continuous experience across clouds or even on-prem that adds new value on top of hyperscale infrastructure. Priya Rajagopal is the director of product management at Couchbase. She's a developer, a software architect, co-creator on a number of patents, as well as being an expert on edge, IOT, and mobile computing technologies. And we're going to talk about edge requirements. Priya, you've been around software engineering and mobile and edge technologies your entire career, and now you're responsible for bringing enterprise class database technology to, to, the, to the edge and IOT environments, synchronizing. So when you think about the edge, the near edge, the far edge, what are the fundamental assumptions that you have to make with regards to things like connectivity, bandwidth, security, and any other technical considerations mm -hmm. when you think about software architecture for these environments? Sure, sure. Uh, first off, Dave, thanks for having me here. It's really exciting to be here again, my second time, and thank you for that kind introduction. Um, so quickly to get back to your question. So when it comes to architecting for the edge, our principle is prepare for the worst and hope for the best. Because really when it comes to edge computing, it's sort of the edge cases that come to bite you. Uh, so you, you mentioned connectivity, bandwidth, security. I have a few more. So starting with connectivity, assume poor or no network connectivity, right? Think offshore oil rigs, cruise ships, or even uh, retail settings, right? When you want to have business continuity, most of the time you've got an internet connection, but then when there is disruption, then you lose business continuity. Then when it comes to bandwidth, uh, we the, the notion, uh, the approach we take is that bandwidth is always limited or it's at a premium, right? Data plans can go up through the roof depending on the volume of data. So think medical clinics in rural areas. When it comes to security, edge poses unique challenges. Uh, because you're sort of moving away from this wall garden, central cloud based environment. And now everything really is accessible over the internet. So, and the internet really is inherently untrustworthy. So every bit of data that is writ uh, written or read by an application needs to be authenticated, needs to be authorized. The entire path needs to be secured end to end, right? It needs to be uh, encrypted. And so that's confidentiality. And also the persistence of data itself, it needs to be encrypted on disk. Now, one of the advantages uh, of, of edge computing or distributing data is that uh, the impacted um, edge environment can sort of be isolated away without impacting the other uh, edge locations. So uh, looking at uh, the classic retail architecture. So if you've got retail use case, if you've got a, a retail store where there's a security breach, you need to have a provision of isolating that store so that you don't bring down services for the other stores. So when it comes to edge computing, you have to think about uh, those aspects of security. Well, you, any of these locations could be breached. And if one of them is breached, how do you control that? So that, that's to answer those three uh, uh, key topics that you brought up, but there are other considerations. Um, so one is data governance, right? That's a huge challenge when, because we are a database company at Couchbase. We think of database, data governance, compliance, privacy, all that is very paramount to our customers. And so it's not just, you know, it's not just about enforcing policies, right? Now we are talking about not enforcing policies in a central location, but you have to do it in a distributed uh, fashion. Um, because one of the benefits of edge computing, as, as you probably very well know, is the benefits it brings when, uh, when it comes to data privacy, governance policies, you can enforce that at a granular scale uh, because data doesn't have to ever leave the edge. But again, um, I talked about this in the context of security, there needs to be a way to control this data at the edge. You have to govern the data when it is at the edge uh, remotely. Uh, some of the other challenges uh, when thinking about the edge is, of course, uh, volume, scale, think IoT, mobile devices, right? Uh, classic far edge type uh, scenarios. And I think the other uh, criteria that we have to keep in mind when we are architecting a platform uh, for this kind of uh, uh, computing paradigm is the heterogeneity of the edge itself. 
So it's no longer, you know, uniform set of compute and um, storage resources that are available at, at your disposal. You've got a variety of IoT uh, devices, you've got mobile devices, different processing capabilities, different storage capabilities. Yeah, when it comes to edge data centers, it's not uniform in terms of what services are available, right? Do they have a load balancer? Do they have a firewall? Can I deploy a firewall, right? So these are all some key architectural con considerations when it comes to actually architecting a solution uh, for the edge. Great, thank you for that, that awesome setup. Now, so we, we've been talking about stretching to, to the edge, this idea of super cloud to connote that single logical layer that spans across multiple clouds. It can, again, it can include on-prem, on but a critical criterion is that the developer and of course the user experience is identical or substantially similar, right? Let's say identical, let's say identical, irrespective of physical location. Priya, is that vision technically achievable today in the world of database? And if so, can you describe the architectural elements that make it possible to perform well and have you know, low latency and the security and other criteria that you just mentioned? Is it just, what's the technical enabler? Is it just good software? Is it architecture? Help us understand that. Sure, you, you brought up two, two aspects. You, you mentioned user experience, right? Uh, and, and then you mentioned uh, from a developer uh, standpoint, right? Uh, what, what does it take? And I'd like to address the two um, separately. I mean, they are very uh, tightly related, but I'd like to address them separately. So just focusing on the easier of the two when it comes to user experience, right? Uh, what, what are the factors that impact user experience? You're talking about reliability of service. So always on, always available sort of application. So it doesn't matter where the data is coming from, right? Whether the data is coming from my device, it's sourced from an on-prem data center, or if it is from uh, the edge of the cloud, it's from a cloud, a central cloud data center. From an end user perspective, all they care about is that their application is available. The next is, of course, responsiveness. You want, users are getting in, increasingly impatient. Right? You want uh, to reduce wait times to service. You want something which is extremely fast. They're looking for immersive uh, ap uh, applications or immersive experiences. So AR, VR, mixed reality kind of use cases. And then something which is very critical and what you just touched upon is this sort of seamless experience, right? Like this omni-channel as we talk about in the context of retail, right? Kind of experience or what I like to uh, refer to as park and pick up sort of reference. So you, um, park, uh, you start your application, running your application, you start a transaction on one device, you park it, pick it up on another device or and or in case of retail, you walk into a store, you pick it up from there, right? So this sort of a park and pick up seamless mobility of data is, is extremely critical. So in the context of, of a database, uh, when we talk about responsiveness, two key, the KPIs are latency, bandwidth, right? And latency is really the round trip time from the time it takes to make a request for data and the response comes back. And uh, the factors that impact latency are of course the type of the network uh, itself, but also the proximity of uh, the data source to the point of consumption. And so the more number of hops that the data has to, uh, 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 data packets have to take to reach uh, the from the source to its destination, then you're going to incur a lot of latency. And uh, when it comes to bandwidth, we're talking about the capacity, right, of the network, how much data can be shoved through the pipe. And of course, when edge computing, large number of clients, I talked about uh, uh, scale, the volume of devices. And when you're talking about all of them concurrently connected, then you're going to have network congestion, which impacts bandwidth, which in turn impacts performance. And so, when it comes to, you know, how do you architect a solution for that? If you completely re remove the reliance on network uh, to the extent possible, then you get the highest guarantees when it comes to responsiveness, availability, uh, reliability, right? Because your application is always going to be on and the pro in order to do that, if you have the data database uh, and the data processing components co-located with the application that needs it, that would give you the best experience. 
But of course, you know, you want to bring it as close. So a lot of times it's not possible to embed that data within uh, your application itself. And that's where you have options of, you know, an on-prem data center, the edge of the cloud, Max, and so on. So the closer you bring the data, you're going to get the better experience. Now, that's that's all great. But then when it comes to something to achieve a vision of, of a super cloud, right? Uh, when, when we talked about, hey, one way from a developer standpoint, I have one API to set up this connection to a server, but then behind the scenes, my data could be resident anywhere. How do you achieve something like that? And so a critical aspect of the solution is data synchronization. So I, I talked uh, about data storage and as, as a database, you know, data storage uh, database, that's a critical aspect of a data database is really the, where the data is persisted, data processing, the APIs to access and query the data. But another really critical aspect of distributing a database is the data synchronization technology. And so once all the islands of data, whether it is on the device, whether it's an on-prem data center, whether it's the edge of the cloud, or whether it is really the regional data center, once all those databases are kept in sync, then it's a question of, well, when uh, connectivity to one of those data centers goes down, then there needs to be a seamless switch to another data center. And today, uh, at least when it comes to Couchbase, a lot of our customers do uh, uh, employ global load balancers, which can automatically detect, right? Uh, so from a perspective of an application, it's just one URL endpoint. But then when one of those uh, services goes down or data centers goes down, we have active failover and standby. And so uh, the load balancer automatically uh, redirects all the traffic to the backup uh, data center. And of course, for that to happen, those two data centers need to be in sync and that's critical. So uh, did that answer your question? Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I, let me, okay. let me jump in here. Cause I, 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 thank you again for that. A lot, I want to mm -hmm. unpack some of those. And I want to use the example of Couchbase Lite, uh, which as the name implies like a mobile version of, of Couchbase. And, and, and I'm interested in, so the number of things that you said, you talked about uh, in some cases you want to get data from the most proximate location. So, do you have, is there a, some kind of metadata intelligence that you have access to? I'm interested in how you, how you do the synchroni synchronization. How do you deal with conflict resolution and recovery if something goes wrong? I mean, this is a, you're talking about distributed database, you know, challenges. Uh, how do you approach all that? Wow, great, a great question. And, and probably one that I could occupy the entire session for, <laughs> okay. but I'll try and I'll, I'll try and keep it brief and, and try and answer most most of the points that you you uh, touched upon. So we talked about distributed database and data sync, right? But here's the other challenge: a lot of these uh, disconnected locations uh, or these distributed locations can actually be dis disconnected. So we've just exacerbated this whole notion of data sync. And that's what we call offline first, not just what we call what is typically referred to as offline first sync, right? For the ability for an application to run in a completely disconnected mode. But then when there is network connectivity, the data is synced back to the backend data servers. And so in order for uh, this to happen, you need a sync protocol. And since you asked in the context of uh, uh, Couchbase, our sync protocol, it's a web sockets, extremely high, uh, lightweight uh, data synchronization protocol that's resilient to network disruption. So what this means is I could have hundreds of thousands of clients that are connected to a data center and they could be at various stages of disconnect, right? And uh, you, you have a field application and then you are veering in and out of uh, pockets of network connectivity. So network is disrupted and then network connectivity is restored. And our sync protocol has got a built-in built checkpoint mechanism that allows the two replicating points to sort of have a handshake of, you know, what was the previous uh, sync point? And only data from that previous sync point is sent to that specific client. And so we, and, and in order to achieve that, you mentioned Couchbase Lite, which is of course our embedded database, uh, for mobile, desktop, and em any embedded platform. But th the one that handles the data synchronization is our Sync Gateway. So we've got a component Sync Gateway that sits with our Couchbase server, and that's responsible for securely syncing the data and implementing this protocol with uh, Couchbase Lite. 
And then the, you talked about uh, conflict resolution. And, and it's great that you mentioned that because when it comes to data sync, a lot of times folks think, oh, well, you know, how hard can that be, right? I mean, you, you request for some data and you pull down a data. And that's great. Uh, and that's the happy part, right? When all of the clients are connected, uh, when there is reliable network connectivity, that's great. But we are, of course, talking about uh, unreliable network connectivity uh, and, and resiliency to network disruptions. And also the fact that you have lots of concurrently connected clients, all of them potentially updating the same piece of data, right? That's when you have a conflict, when two or more clients are updating the same clients or writers. I mean, you could have the rights coming in from the clients, you could have the rights coming in from the backend systems. Either way, multiple writers to the same piece of data, that's when you have conflicts. Now, when it comes to, so a, a little bit to, to explain how conflict resolution is handled within our data sync protocol in, in Couchbase, it would help to understand a little bit about how our, uh, you know, what kind of database we are, how is data itself uh, stored within our database. So Couchbase Lite is a NoSQL JSON document store, which means everything is stored as JSON documents. Mm -hmm. And so, Every time there is a write, right, an update to a document, let's say you start with an initial version of the document, the document is created. Every time there is a mutation to a document, you have a new revision to that document. Okay, so as you build in more writes or more mutations to that document, you build out a, what's called a revision tree. And so when does a conflict happen? Conflict happens when there is a branch in the tree, right? So you've got two writers writing to the same revision then you get a branch and that's what is a conflict. Mm -hmm. And so we have a way of detecting those conflicts automatically. And when that's conflict detection, right? So now we know there's a conflict, but we have to resolve it. And within Couchbase, you have two options. You don't have to do anything about it. Uh, the system has built-in automatic conflict resolution heuristics built in. Uh, so it's going to check, pick a winning revision. And so we use a bunch of criteria and we pick a winning revision. So if two writers are updating the same revision of the document, version of the document, we pick a winner. But then that seemed to work from our experience, 80% of the use cases. Uh, but then for the remaining 20%, applications would like to have more control over how the um, winner of the conflict is picked, right? And for that, uh, applications can implement a custom conflict resolver. So will automatically detect the conflicting revisions mm -hmm. and send these conflicting revisions over to the application via a callback and the application has access to the entire document body, right, of the two revisions mm -hmm. and can use whatever criteria it needs to merge. So, so that's two -way so that's policy-based in that example. Yes, yeah. uh, yes. Yeah. So okay. you can have user policy-based or you can have uh, the automatic heuristics. Okay, I, yeah. and I got I to gotta wrap because we're out of time, but I, 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 I want to run this scenario by you. One of, the, one of the risks to the super cloud nirvana that we always talk about is this notion of a new architecture emerging at the edge, far edge really, because it's, 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 they're highly distributed environments, they're low power, uh, tons of data, and this idea of AI inferencing at the edge, a lot of the AI today is done as modeling in the cloud. When you think about ARM processors and, and these new low cost devices and massive processing power, eventually overwhelming the economics and then that's seeping back into the enterprise and disrupting it. Now you still get the problem of federated governance and security and that's probably going to be mm -hmm. more centralized slash federated. But in, in, in one minute, do you see that AI inferencing real time taking off at the edge? Do you see, you know, where, where is that on the, on the S curve? Oh, absolutely, right. Uh, when it comes to IoT uh, sort of applications, it's all about massive volumes of data generated at the edge. You talked about the uh, economics doesn't add up. Now you need to actually, the data needs to be actioned at some point. And if you have to transfer all of that over the internet, 
for uh, analysis, the responsiveness, you're going to lose that. You're not going to get that real-time responsiveness and availability. And so the edge is the perfect location. And a lot of this data is temporal in nature. So you don't want that to be uh, sent back to the cloud for long-term persistence, but instead you want that to be action close as possible to the source itself. And when you talk about, I mean, there are of course the really small microcontrollers and so on. Even there, you can actually have some local processing done like tiny ML. Uh, models, but then mobile devices, when you talk about those, as you're very well aware, right? I mean, these are extremely capable. They have, they're capable of running uh, uh, neural, uh, they have neural network processors. Uh, and so they can do a lot of processing locally itself. But then when you want to have a sort of an aggregated view within the edge, you want to process that data in an IoT gateway and only send the aggregated data back to the cloud for long-term analytics and, and uh, persistence. Yeah, this so, is something we're watching and I think could be highly disruptive and, and it's hard to predict. Priya, I got to go. Thanks so much for coming on theCUBE. Really appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you. All right, you're watching SuperCloud 22. We'll be right back right after this short break.